Hello and welcome to another episode of Energy Express. I'm your host, Zach Harold. We're going to begin today's episode with our friend Misha Poor. She's West Virginia University's Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And today we're going to talk about the common good. Hello, friends. Misha Poor here, Vice President for the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at West Virginia University. Let's talk. Today, let's talk about the common good. Our community is stronger when we pool our resources, our individual gifts, and our individual talents and work together for a strong and prosperous community. When we care about others and they care about us, and we work together to ensure that everyone around us is cared for, well, that's common good. At its root, the common good is the intersection of our rights and our responsibilities. When we each actively participate in the life of our community, this collective action helps make sure that each of us are being cared for and that our needs and that of others around us are being met. Our actions as individuals have consequences and they impact others. Those consequences can be harmful or they can be for the common good. When we serve others, we all benefit. Like they say, when you know better, you do better. And we all can do better. See you next time. Now, accidents are just a part of life, but it's important to be prepared when scary things happen. Ann Dugan is here to talk about what to do in case of an emergency and how to administer some basic first aid. Hi. My name is Ian Dugan and I'm from the Safety and Health Extension at WVU. Today I want to take a few minutes to talk to you about first aid and calling 911. In any emergency situation, we want you to stay safe, stay calm, and then provide care and comfort to the sick or injured person. To stay safe, we want you to look at your surroundings and make sure that everything is safe for you. Remember that you can't help if you get hurt too. After you determine that it is safe, we want you to stay calm. An emergency situation can be very scary, so it may feel like your heart is pounding, your hands may be shaking. We want you to take a deep breath, try to relax, and stay calm. Provide care and comfort to the person who is sick or hurt. Reassure them that you are calling for help, and if there's an, another person around, they can also help you. When should we call 911? If there is an emergency where you need help and you can't handle the emergency on your own, examples like someone is having trouble breathing, someone is bleeding, someone is not responding, there's been a car accident, or someone is severely sick, those are all times that you should call 911. We don't want to call 911 as a joke or for silly reasons like asking for help with your homework. So only call 911 if it's a true emergency. When you're on the phone with 911, the dispatcher is going to ask you a lot of questions. They're going to ask your name, your address, what's happened, and what you've done so far. Make sure that you stay on the phone until the 911 dispatcher tells you it's okay to hang up. Be prepared to give them your address. And since many accidents and emergencies happen at home, we really need you to make sure that you know your home address. So work with an adult at your house and practice learning your address. You need to know your house number, the street, and the town that you live in. If the emergency happens somewhere else, give them as much information as you can. The address if you know it, the closest location, anything that will help get the help to you quickly. First aid supplies are also important. So we're gonna take a look at a first aid kit. And we're also going to look at some examples of first aid emergencies. First aid kits can come in all shapes and sizes, and they may have a lot of contents or very few. Here is an example of a basic first aid kit, and these are really supplies that we should have in all of our first aid kits. Gloves, gauze pads, gauze rolls, band-aids, and you may also want to consider having an ice pack, scissors, tweezers, tape, an emergency blanket, and triangular bandages. There could even be medication in your first aid kits. Things like aspirin, Benadryl, and triple antibiotic ointment can all be helpful in a first aid emergency. An example of a first aid emergency would be bleeding. 
So we have Austin and Ryan to demonstrate how to control bleeding to the arm. Ryan is holding a gauze roll or a gauze pad in place. Austin is going to roll the gauze roll around the gauze pad to help secure it. So this would be for bleeding that we can kind of handle ourselves, or maybe severe bleeding that we're trying to stop while we're waiting for the ambulance to come and help us. As you can see, they're holding that rather snug and they're wrapping the gauze roll around the gauze pad. And we also have his arm elevated, which will help slow down and stop the bleeding. Austin is wearing gloves to help protect himself from other people's blood. Once the gauze is rolled in place, we can still hold pressure with our gloved hand and then elevate his arm to slow down and stop the bleeding. Someone that is interested in taking a first aid or CPR class, they can visit our website at www.trainingcentertechnologies.com slash WVU, or they can call our office at 304-293-7527. Remember, in any emergency, stay safe, stay calm, and provide care and comfort. Next up, our friend Joey from WVU Extension Fire Service is going to talk to us about how to stay safe during a home fire. Pay close attention because a little bit later, Joey's going to be joined by his son Eli for a pop quiz about home fire safety. My name is Joey Baxa. I'm an adjunct instructor with West Virginia University Fire Service Extension. And we're here today to talk about kids' fire safety. But before we really get into the fire safety aspect of what I want to speak about today, I first want to talk about preventing children from getting burnt. So as kids, you're going to want to see what mom and dad are doing, sometimes in the kitchen or in the garage, but some of those items are hot. And we need to make sure that we're staying away from those and we're not putting our hands on them. So if you're in the kitchen and mom or dad's cooking, don't reach up and grab the pot. Do not open up the uh, oven door or touch any of that stuff. We wanna to try to stay three feet away from it. Anything that's hot that your parents are using a pair of gloves or making sure that they're not touching, you don't need to be anywhere near it. Now as we move into the fire, more fire safety aspect of what I wanna speak about, I wanna start with the very first thing that everybody should be doing in their homes. And this is your homework for you. Your homework today is I want you to go home and ask your parents if you have working smoke detectors. Have them show them to you. Let them hit the test button so you know what it sounds like. And whenever you hear that beep beep, then you'll have to learn what to do. So the first thing is, do you have smoke detectors in your home? Where are they and do they work? If they don't work, make sure your parents are placing. Second thing, once the smoke detector goes off, we have to know how to get out of the house and that's called an exit drill. And just like you'd have a play or a plan for what you're going to do in a, in a sports game, be it basketball or football, or even on a video game, we have to know what we're going to do whenever that smoke detector goes off. So to do that, we're going to sit down with our parents and we're going to draw it out on a map maybe. And then we're going to practice it. We'll hit the smoke detector. Whenever it goes beep beep, we're going to find our way out of our house and we need to know two ways, just in case we can't get out the first way or the way that we would normally go in and out of our house. Whenever we do that, if we're coming to a closed door, we wanna check it with the back of our hand or crack it open and see if we can get out of it. If it's smoky, we wanna stay low, but if it's really smoky outside our bedroom door or if it's really hot, we just wanna shut that door and stay behind it and let it protect us. So the closed door is a third big point I want to talk about. Sleeping with your bedroom door closed increases your chance of getting out of a house fire uninjured without any problems at all. So if we sleep with our bedroom door closed, that'll keep all the smoke, all the heat, and those nasty things that are in a fire, it'll keep them away from you, and you won't have to worry about them, and the firefighters can come get you. They'll get you, they'll rescue, they're very well trained to do so. So keep your door closed at night and give them a chance to do just that. All right, and once we're out of the house, we need to make sure that the firefighters are on their way. And this piece of information can be used anytime we have an emergency, be it our mom and dad are hurt or they won't wake up, 
or somebody might be trying to break into our house. But in this case, we're talking about if we have a fire. And if we have a fire, we need to dial 911. And that'll, that person that answers the phone can start pushing buttons and dispatching firefighters to help put out your fire. And those are the professionals that we want to go into the home and save those things that we might think are valuable, but they're not worth putting any risk on ourselves to get out of there. And then number five, the last thing that I'm, I'm gonna talk about is firefighters can look scary in their turnout gear. Their, their clothing that they'll put on that protects them from the heat and from the smoke. They'll have a special tank on their back. They might sound a little funny when they breathe. So when they come to our house, we shouldn't hide from them, even if we're outside or inside. If you're in your bedroom safe from the fire and they come to save you or to help you, then you need to let them know you're there. Don't run from them, don't hide from them, don't go under your bed, don't go in your closet. They're your friend. And no matter how scary they might look, all that stuff, all that special equipment is just to protect them so that they can help you. And now it's pop quiz time. We're gonna ask Eli here. How old are you, Eli? Eight. Eight years old. Eli's been paying attention, or he's supposed to have been paying attention to what we've been discussing today. And there's five things that we need to remember whenever we're talking about fire safety. So Eli, the first question, what number do you call if you have a fire? 911. You call 911. All right, what do you need to be prepared to tell them? Do you know that? Do you need to tell them where you live? Mm -hmm. You need to be able to know your address and what mm -hmm. kind of emergency you're having, right? Mm -hmm. So they can get the right people. All right. All right, question number two. If we have a fire, do you go back in after your pets? No. Why not? Because then it will risk our lives burning ourselves. Right, we don't want to do that, right? Mm -mm. So we want, to, we want to stay safe and let the firefighters do their job, right? Mm -hmm. All right, now to be safe at night in case there's a fire, how do we sleep with our bedroom door? Closed. Closed, right, to keep all those heat and gases, it's some toxic gases out, right? And all those nasty things. Yeah, all those nasty things, huh? All right. All right, do we touch hot pots that are on the stove? No. No, who do we leave that to? Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad are our parents, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and that very last thing, or should we be afraid of firefighters? No. No, you live with a firefighter, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks kids. Thank you for paying attention. Remember your homework. What was their homework, Eli? Because to see if they have smoke detectors, yes, right? To yeah. See, if they have... see, you forgot something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, remember your homework today is to go home and make sure you have working smoke detectors in your home. And you might even ask mom and dad to change your batteries. Have a good day. And don't forget to practice. <laughs> On to the next segment. Hi, I'm Amy Cook, the family and community development agent for WVU Extension Service in Braxton and Clay Counties. And today we're gonna to talk about kitchen safety. Okay, we're in my kitchen and this is how the tour is gonna to work. I'm gonna show you around and you're going to point things out to me that might not be safe and we might talk about why those aren't safe, okay? Well, let's get started. Here we go, see my kitchen cabinets there, right? We keep all of our dishes and things like that. We've got some nice fruit on the counter. I like to keep flowers because I think they're pretty and they make me happy. Oh, now we found a knife. Anything dangerous about that? Yeah, we probably don't wanna keep knives just laying around out in the open. They could get knocked off the counter and hurt someone. A small child or an animal could come along and get a hold of them. So we want to keep those tucked away in our safe cabinets or drawers where we identify that we're going to keep our sharp objects, right? Good. Let's keep going. What else do we see here? Okay. All right. We've got my paper towels. We all need paper towels in the kitchen, right? And it looks like we have a candle here. Uh-oh. What if I had that candle lit? Does that look safe to you? Well, what might happen there? Right, so the candle could catch the paper towels on fire really easily, huh? 
I agree. We're gonna have to move that candle away, right? And when we're not using it, we should keep the lid on it anyway. All right, so we've come to my sink, okay? We've got soap and hand sanitizer, good. We're gonna need that in a little bit when we wash our hands, right? We've got some more cabinets. We've got my mixer. Now we're coming up on my stove top. Let's see. Hmm. What do you think about my stove top? Let me give you a better angle here. Yeah, that looks kind of dangerous, doesn't it? What could happen there? Right, so somebody could easily walk by, and since we have the handle sticking out over top of the counter, they could accidentally bump into that. They could spill something really hot on themselves or on someone else, or even it could dump into the floor and get their feet, couldn't it? So we always keep our handles turned inward, right? We never want those to be out over top of the counter where they could get bumped into. Good job. Okay, let's go inside my oven and see what we can find. Hmm. Well, it needs cleaned, I can tell you that, right? Oh, wait a minute. Should we put plastic in the oven? What's gonna happen there? Yeah, it would melt, wouldn't it? So we never wanna keep plastic in the oven. If we're cooking in the oven, we need to be using a metal or a glass pan or cookware that's approved for oven use, right? Good eye. Okay, so now we're gonna come around. I have some utensils there, but nothing sharp, so that's good. Let's come around to my pantry here. I've got my microwave. Let's check out my microwave. What do we see there? Looks like someone's heating up some leftovers, huh? Is that what we should heat our leftovers up in? No, you're right. So metal and aluminum foil can't go in the microwave because guess what? They catch on fire too. Yeah, so we don't wanna put metal or aluminum foil in the microwave. For the microwave, we need to use a plastic dish, right? Or a glass in the microwave. Something approved for microwave use. Good job. Okay, well that concludes the tour of my kitchen. I'll just give you a glance around here. You did a great job pointing out some really dangerous things. Okay, now it's time to cut some stuff up. So I want you to know that the cucumber and the lemon that we're gonna cut up, I have already pre-washed those to make sure that they're clean because what happens is if I don't and then I take my knife to cut them up, I'm getting the germs that are on the surface of the fruit or the vegetable, and I'm kind of putting those down inside where I'm gonna be eating later, right? So that's not a good idea. So one of the most important things we can think about when we're cutting things up and we're using knives in the kitchen is that we should always use the appropriate sized knife or sharp tool. And the reason for that is when we use something that's bigger than what we need, there's a bigger risk of us uh, accidentally cutting ourselves. So let me ask you a question. What do you think? Do we need this size knife to cut up the cucumber and the lemon? Think we need that big of a knife? That's more for like a watermelon, isn't it? Yeah, so we only wanna use a knife that's as big as what we need. And this one will do the job just fine. So we're gonna use a smaller knife. Now, when we're cutting, here's what we want to remember. We wanna keep our, our hands, our fingers, any part of our body, as far away from the point of cutting as we can, okay? But we wanna make things steady so that they don't move around on us. So I'm going to keep my fingers about this far from where I'm actually the cutting point, okay? And so we also want to pay attention to the, to the method of cutting. So I'm cutting away from my body. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. If I had this cucumber in my hand, and I was going to cut it, I might be inclined to take my knife and cut it like this, which would be cutting towards my body. That's not what we wanna do. We always wanna cut things on a flat surface, a cutting board, a plate, something like that. And we want to cut away from our bodies, okay? So I'm using my cutting board, I'm cutting in a downward motion away from my body, right? I cut the ends off of my cucumber. 
excellent. I want to peel my cucumber. So again, I want to hold it steady and I'm keeping it in a downward motion. And since I have the smaller knife, I'm able to handle it really easily. I'm not having to worry about that knife coming in contact with my fingers, right? So those are the main things I want you to know about knife safety. Use the appro appropriate tool and appropriate size. Always cut away from your body. And I think we can do this safely. What do you think? All right. Well, thanks for joining me today. You know, I've been thinking about something. If you raise sheep, you're a shepherd. If you raise cows, you're a rancher. But if you raise chickens, does that make you a chicken tender? Hi, I'm Carrie Cart. I work for WVU Extension Service in Kanawha County with the Family and Community Development Unit. And today, I'm gonna to show you how easy it is to make a fresh fruit tart. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a little mini loaf pan and wonton wrappers. Now that may sound a little odd, wonton wrappers are normally something you would think about for Chinese food, but we're gonna use them to make a shell for our fruit. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little cooking spray and I'm gonna spray the inside of my pan. I like to spray it, that way it doesn't stick. Um, and it does have a tendency to stick if you don't spray it. Now the wonton wrappers you can generally buy in your um, produce section of the grocery store. Um, they're fine, small little squares, they're very thin. So you have to be careful. If you're not careful, you can easily poke straight through them, especially if you have fingernails on. So what I like to do is take all four corners and fold them up just like that. Once I get it folded, I drop it right down into the square of my muffin tin and open it up. Just like that. Let me show you again. You take that wonton square, fold the corners up. One, two, three, four. Drop it down into the muffin tin and just push it down in there. Once you get your muffin tin all filled, you're going to go ahead and put that in the oven at 350 degrees for anywhere between five and eight minutes, depending on how hot your oven is. Some ovens get a little hotter than others, so you wanna keep an eye on them. They will burn quickly. So just like that. I'm gonna go ahead and finish filling those up, and pop them in the oven, and we'll pull them out fresh. All right, so I've pulled the wontons from the oven. You can see how lovely they look. They're all a little different shaped, and that's okay. Creativity is, is always a little different and unique. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little bit of sugar-free or reduced sugar jam. Now the flavor I have here is uh, blackberry jam. You can use any kind that you like, any kind of uh, preserves that you have, but keep in mind if you use a reduced sugar or a light version, it's a little easier on the calories. And we just take a little bit in there, maybe about a teaspoon, and we plop them right into the bottom of those wontons. It gives it a nice creamy bottom and a nice little sweetness added to it. And then I have a couple of different flavored yogurts. So I've got a blueberry as well as a strawberry. These are both a low fat yogurt. Um, and they're just a store brand yogurt. You don't need a fancy, expensive yogurt. Um, if you like Greek yogurt, you could use that or a vanilla. Um, and really, you can use any fruit combination flavors that you like. I like to use the berries because this time of year, they're so fresh. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of blueberry here. And I'm just gonna mix up a little, little dollop. You can be a little more generous with the yogurt because that's a little uh, better for you. And I'm just gonna drop a little bit in there right on top of my jam. Well, let's do one with the strawberry too. Just a little bit right on top. You kind of got to work with them to fill them. And then I have some yummy blueberries 
and blackberries. And they look beautiful. I've washed them already, so they're all nice and clean and ready to go. So I'm gonna take and put this nice big juicy one on top of that one. And on this one, I'm gonna put a couple blueberries on it. Now let's put a couple more. Blueberries are so good for you. There are the blueberries, and I'm gonna put another blackberry on this one. And that's all there is to it. And you keep filling them until they're all full, and then you have these wonderful little um, fruit tarts that are wonderful and tasty. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Energy Express. I hope you learned a lot of useful stuff today. I know I sure did. We'll be right back here tomorrow, same place, same time. We hope you will too. We'll see you then.